Hello gardeners and thank you so much for joining us. This is Mid-American Gardener and we have lovely panelists here tonight. They're going to teach us lots of things and it's going to be great. So we're glad that you're here. I'm Diane Noland and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in the Crop Sciences Department in the College of Aces. Now let's find out who's here. I'm going to look directly across the table at Chuck Boyd. Hi Chuck. Hi Diane. I'm also in the Department of Crop Sciences and Horticulture. My specialties are vegetables and herbs, so questions along those lines would probably uh, be easier for me to answer. Um, what else? That's, that's good enough. That ought to do it. I brought this in. This is <coughs> Jade Princess Ornamental Millet. It's a fairly new one. Um, it, it stays relatively short. It's like about two feet. Uh, they, they kind of come out at an angle about like this. Uh, so it kind of spreads out, sort of vase-shaped. Um, really quite nice. Uh, it's pollenless, so it doesn't set seeds, so seedlings won't be an issue. Um, it has the, the jade part. It has sort of chartreuse leaves, and, and there was a comical thing that happened. We have it in the planter out in front of the building, and our crop science uh, extension person uh, looked at it once and said, needs nitrogen. I said, nah. <laughs> it's, it's kind of genetic. I don't think, I think you could really, really overdo it with the nitrogen and it would stay kind of, kind of this color. Uh, but it, it's really been, it's really been nice. They come out, this one's a little, a little past its prime, kind of a purplish color to it. And we have some reds and purples in the, in the bed with it that it kind of picks up really nicely. It has, it has a fragrance, which to me is sort of like sorghum molasses, if you've ever had that. Uh, one of the students in my class tonight, when I showed it to them, uh, said she thought they stink. So perhaps if you have 50 or 100 of them somewhere, uh, the, the smell can get kind of overpowering because some, some pleasant smelling things can do that. But I think it's kind of interesting. I, I like the, the, the color that, that other things can pick up. And uh, my mother always loved chartreuse, so that I'm, not that, I'm not that bad on that, although some of the yellow things are not not my favorite. Well, in that planter, you have it with a real attractive, bright pink zinnia, as I recall. And what else? It, it's just a beautiful combination. There's in that a sun coleus in there. Uh, there's some, um, well, there's um, the, the marguerite oh. sweet potato, oh, with the which, chartreuse. which is really <gasps> chartreuse, which kind of picks it up. So it all coordinates, I, th I think, pretty well. I thought it was one of your nicest combinations in that planter ever. Well, we might have to get a picture of that. If you're that. in town, yeah, stop by nice. Turner Hall and <laughs> check it, it out. It really is a nice combination. <coughs> Thank you for bringing that. I think that is interesting. Okay, now we're going to go next to Kay Carnes. Hi, Kay. Hi, Diane. Um, <clears throat> I'm a Champaign County Master Gardener, and my area of interest is also vegetables, but primarily heirloom vegetables. Uh, I also um, am interested in herbs and seed saving mm -hmm. and perennials. And I, today I have a show and tell. I have a squash that I grew this year that I'm very excited about. Um, this is the early stage of the squash. It's called Ramp Conte. It's R-A-M-P-I-C-A-N-T-E. And at this stage, you treat it like a summer squash or like zucchini. Um, and I actually, I like it a little better than zucchini because it's a little wow. drier. It doesn't have quite as high a water content. So with, when you're cooking, it holds up a little better. So if you let them go. So interesting. Show them the big brother. <laughs> you end if up you with let this. them go. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is the winter squash form of it. Wow. And you use it for pies, um, baking, um, whatever. So you can go sweet what, or savory. Uh, yes, with that. yes, uh, and um, winter squash are amazing. Um, and this really, this squash did very well this year. It's a long vining squash, so those of you with small gardens um, you might want to try trellising it or wrap it around the garden a few times. <laughs> um, but it it really did take off and do well. But I'm I'm really excited about it. Well, and, and like a butternut squash, everything from there up is just solid. That's correct. Solid this this meat is all in salad in, in meat, that and it, it's an Italian heirloom. And if you saw that, and then you saw the green version, you would think it was two different. You would. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's really. I think you should leave it on the table <laughs> until we're told to get it off the table. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I really like it, so there just leave go. it on there. It's a, <laughs> it's a lovely decoration. Thank you, Kay. That is so interesting. Rampicante 
squash. Mm -hmm. Okay, and what did you say about that, Tom, when you come here? You learn something. Every time I'm on TV here, I'm or, or watch it at home, uh, I do learn something. Okay, well, the person right here next to me that I'm putting on the spot is Dr. Tom Voigt. Go ahead, hit it, Tom. Good evening, Diane and uh, panelists. Uh, Tom Voigt, I work with uh, perennial uh, grasses at the University of Illinois. Uh, in the Department of Crop Sciences, turf, landscape grasses, prairie species, just a variety of uh, perennial grasses. Uh, for my show and tell, we're going to go to a slide. Uh, I, working in extension, I've received several calls and emails recently uh, dealing with the problem that you see on these lovely little uh, loafers uh, on the screen. Uh, you see the little orange uh, uh, spots on them. That's, uh, those are spores from uh, rust on, on turf. Uh, and I've received calls from people who have gone out and mowed their lawns, come in with, with all sorts of orange or, or uh, reddish brown, uh, th this dust on their shoes, and they're concerned about it. Uh, rust uh, generally hits, hits our turf here uh, in late, uh, late summer, early autumn. It's usually associated with a, with a, a, a need for nitrogen fertilizer. Uh, and this year in particular, it's pretty, uh, we can explain that pretty easily. We've had, we, uh, we've had a lot of uh, cool weather. We've had a lot of rainfall. The turf has grown a great deal and probably used the, whatever nitrogen was put down earlier in the year. So it's, it's uh, in, in need of a, of a shot of N. Uh, I would uh, think, uh, I would recommend that uh, uh, the, probably the best time of the year to, to fertilize your lawn would be right, coming up right now close to Labor Day. So mm -hmm. this, is, uh, this is just a, a good uh, message uh, to A. It, the, this usually doesn't kill turf here, uh, a little shot of fertilizer and generally it'll come out of, the turf will come out of that okay. Well, those uh, were an interesting color pair of shoes due to the <laughs> rust. So thank you, because I have been hearing about it too. A lot mm -hmm. of folks have mentioned it. Okay, well, let's go next to a Did You Know segment. Measuring your water usage is easy. All you have to do is place several empty cans around your lawn. After you water your lawn, measure the amount of water in each can. This will let you know how much water you are using and how evenly the water is going on. One inch of water per week should be enough. All right, let's go next to the phone lines and we're gonna start first uh, on line one about an Aspen with Becky. Hello, Becky. Hi, thank you for taking my call. You're welcome. My question is, is I know that aspen trees will put up new sprouts when they are cut down. My question is, will they do the same if they are only girdled? If they are only girdled? Yes. Well, I believe aspen, aspen trees put up suckers, suckers when they're growing and when they're cut down and when they're girdled, don't you think? I think probably uh, <clears throat> it might sap the vigor enough by girdling them that it would minimize it, but, but they, they tend, to, tend to root sucker and, and form little groves. That's why you have those, those on the sides of mountains in Colorado, mm -hmm. that's why you have those. It's basically a clone of, of aspens that, that all turn exactly the same color. Um, I suspect they're still going to come up like that. The because of the root suckering yeah. part. We, uh, we grow a, a great uh, many different types of poplars, and aspens are actually uh, uh, related to eastern cottonwoods there, and uh, uh, that's a, a widely used bioenergy crop because it does okay. send up a lot of shoots. So we coppice it, meaning we cut it off at the ground level in order to force it to become shrub-like. Uh, and so it, it, it and willows are two of the more uh, used uh, uh, for pulpwood or for other uh, um, other areas where you'd or other uses where you'd want to have a uh, um, a coppice or a, a shrub a sm yeah. instead of one trunk but uh, multiple smaller trunks. And you want that to happen with the bioenergy, but most homeowners would not. Yeah, that's <laughs> they un want. that's not a good trait uh, mm -hmm. typically in a home lawn or a home garden. Yeah, they tend to get surface roots and then they tend to sprout yeah. from them, <clears throat> and both of those things are. Annoying. Very yeah. difficult yeah. for <coughs> if you want to mow or if you want to landscape with mm -hmm. a single tree. Very interesting. Well, we are waiting for more phone calls. So while we're doing that, let's go to your email and start with you, Chuck. Okay. <clears throat> so tomato blight question. How do I deal with tomato blight? I tried moving to a new location this year and my tomatoes have it again. 
Is there anything I can spray on the tomato plants? Is it possible to kill the spores in the ground? Um, let's see, what's in order? Is there anything you can spray? Probably as a preventive, there are some fungicides that might help. Um, the spores get around, so unless, depending on how far away the location is, uh, just a move might not help. I worry about mine because I use tomato cages and I don't always wash them down with, with bleach. And I worry a little bit that I'm, I'm transferring spores of blight with my tomato cages. So I may uh, get a spritzer or something and just, just bleach them down. Uh, that, might be, that might be an issue. Um, I saw this on, on another TV program uh, where they were actually taking off some of the, of the, lower, the lower leaves. Uh, just so that the spores don't splash up onto the lower leaves. And once they're on the lower leaves, then it's like a ladder effect. They go right on up the plant. Uh, the other thing that you can do is once, once the tomatoes are established and the, and the ground is nice and warm, put a straw mulch or something under them so that, again, that you don't get things splashing up on them. Um, the other thing is if, if, if you don't want to spray a fungicide and you see the first, the first little issues on the lower leaves, go ahead and take off the, anything that looks infected and, and get it away because it's just going to proliferate. And uh, this has been, in my estimation, a, a pretty bad year for that because it has been so wet and you get rain after rain after rain and uh, humid humidity and heat now, which just just really makes them, makes them go very quickly. I've had people ask me <laughs> that, you know, their tomatoes look fine, but they just drop. They're, and they'll find one laying on the ground, and it's perfectly formed. There's no blossom end rot. It just is it heat, and it's been it could more be recently. heat. It, some of the some of the newer varieties have been. It was been, Roma. Okay, um, yeah. The 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 paste type tomatoes tend to not be attached real strongly. Okay. And and because they are the tomatoes are good from what they said. Well, and the nice thing about Romas is that is it. Even if they're ripe and they fall on the ground, they tend to keep pretty well unless they're just sitting in the mud. Uh, so pick them up, and if the plant still looks healthy, it, it's just they have a really, a really, really loose attachment. Okay. Some some of the heirlooms, on the other hand, <laughs> you almost need a machete to get them to come loose because they don't want to turn loose of them. They don't have that that strong. Uh, abscission point. Yes, that, well, some of them have too <coughs> good of an abscission point. Yes, I have some of those too. <laughs> well, we do have a phone call, and then we'll come back to some emails here in a bit, but we did want to get to the tomato question. That is really a big one this year. We have a phone call from Maxine, and I'm not sure what line it is, but let's go to Maxine and her question next. Maxine, are you there? Yes, I am. What's your question? I have uh, two citrus trees. One's a tangerine, and one's a Meyer lemon. And I would like to uh, know if I could trim those before I bring them in this winter. They're in pots and they've gotten quite large. I would say- We're you, looking at Chuck. I would say, <laughs> thanks. Uh, I would say you, you probably can. It, in my estimation, it might be better to trim it. it Obviously, you can't do this this year. It might be better to trim them when you take them outside. That's what I was thinking. Because they're going to take, a, they're going to put on a lot of new fresh growth, and and probably set up flower buds to make the fruit. That that's kind of why you're growing them. Uh, if 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 they've grown and been happy through the whole summer, and you do too much pruning, I, I think you're gonna you're gonna take off a lot of the of the potential fruit that you might have. Obviously, if if they're too big for the space where you want to put them, you have to do something. Just uh, you know, be as moderate as you can. Okay, so thank you for your question. Let's go to Deb's question about gourds on line two. Hi, Deb. Oh, I what? want to know when is a good time to pick uh, decorative gourds that I planted <coughs> earlier this spring. Okay, when to pick decorative gourds? Well, when they're really, the outside is really hard. Um, usually if, if you scrape your fingernail on it and it doesn't make a mark it's ready to be picked so Al also if they're where you can kind of lift them mm -hmm. up they t they start to get lighter as they get more mature and so if it has a nice hard shell and is is, is not real heavy and as they go further the stem might even go from a, a green to a mm -hmm. start to be a tan mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah, I think both of those are, all three of those ideas right. are good. Uh, again, speaking of bleach, if you do a, a very dilute bleach solution on them, sometimes that'll help them keep a lot longer because there might be spores of things that cause Is surface that rots right? on them. A dilute bleach mm -hmm. solution, okay. Like 5% or? Yeah. Not yeah. very much at all. A glug <laughs> in a gallon. Somewhere between 10 to 1 and 20 to 1, somewhere okay. in there. All right, well, very good. <coughs> Thank you for your question. I think it's going to be a good year for, for gourds. Now, let's go to Mary's question, and it's about a maple on line three. Hi there, Mary. Hi, yes. <laughs> I think it's a maple tree. It has the little minute uh, whirligig deals. When I bought my house, it had been girdled, so I took plastic back and gave it some room. But, and now the trunk has started to split, and I peel some back. It's black. And now I'm noticing up not too far. The leaves look like they've been thin. They're starting to uh, just curl. But the leaves turn red this time of year. So I don't know what my problem is. Now, if... Is the split on a certain side of the tree? Well, it's not real picky. Uh, okay, so it's know. multiple. <clears throat> so there could be multiple damage points or, I was trying to figure out if it was sun scald or frost cracking. But it sounds like there's multiple damage mm -hmm. points on it. I believe a tree could live quite a little while even with some damage. So um, you're gonna have to watch it, but something is happening to it. See what happens next spring. If it's if it's mm -hmm. really on the way out, it's going to look even worse in the spring. Mm -hmm. And if it's going to try to overcome it, it'll probably come out and and start trying to overcome it. So. And we have had good moisture that <coughs> then turned off for some people, and then went into heat, and that'll make the leaves, mm -hmm. and also make a tree not extremely happy. Yeah. So you might just I, we're going to say let's wait and see, you know. And it, and really, you can have some damage and it will last a little bit longer. So I'd say wait and see, just watch it, make sure it's not getting weaker and near a home. You know, you know, have an arborist if you're really not sure next spring. Come and see it. Okay, well thank you very much <coughs> for that. We're gonna go to a question about woolly thyme and Mary has this question on line four. Hi Mary. Hello Diane. I have a question about um, woolly thyme. I bought it last year and I'm using it as ground cover and it's, it's really done well as a spread. Is this also something that I can use in cooking? Okay. Probably not I, so much. You got two shaking their head and I would probably <laughs> shake my head. Yeah, generally speaking, the more ornamental a thyme is, the less culinary it is, mm -hmm. just generally speaking. Uh, usually they've been selected for one or the other. Um, it, it wouldn't hurt you to use it, but I don't think the f you'd probably have to use more. And I'm, I'm not even sure how much flavor it has, even if you would use more. Mm -hmm. Woolly thyme is pretty much just a, a low-growing ornamental type. You know, a, a French or an English mm -hmm. or, even or a, a lemon. Lim I would mm -hmm. say get a lemon. That's a low-growing mm -hmm. one. And there's, uh, there's some variegated ones. Oh, yeah, and so get, have the woolly, but you then get a second one if you have the room for it because those are much more flavorful flavorful but they're still ornamental mm -hmm. but um, yeah. I think woolly is extremely attractive it's just I've never tried to cook and with it and it stays so low it's it, just wonderful yeah. it's gorgeous but you do you do see weeds grow in it right away because if they grow an inch you notice them <laughs> so you want to get the weeds out of there right away if that happens okay well we're going to go to you Kay for okay. a email and then we'll come back to the phone lines. Well, I have an email from a viewer that says, my zucchini plant starts producing a zucchini, then it turns yellow on the tip and dies about two inches long. What do I need to do to keep it growing? Well, um, the most cases, this is a problem with pollination. Squash have two flowers. They have a male flower and a female flower. Um, you're fruit grows out of the female flower uh, and oftentimes the uh, males, the males flowers tend to be upright and not always where they need to be um, to fertilize the female flower. So that, that's what will happen is that the, the fruit will start to grow and then it'll just die off because it hasn't been fertilized. 
Um, you can hand fertilize uh, flowers if this is a chronic problem and usually I see some do that but I end up getting plenty without worrying about it. Another thing that can cause that is blossom end rot and that's something you always think about with tomatoes mm -hmm. but it will happen in squash too although it's uh, not as common. If it's really wet phytophthora mm -hmm. can sometimes get going too which yes. is a a fungal disease. And was it was probably the case this year a lot <coughs> with the wet, cold weather we had early. Okay, very good. And now, Tom, let's go to you for your email question. Okie doke. Um, the question was probably sent in the spring, but um, uh, it, it's very appropriate for, uh, for right now as well. Uh, my lawn has brown spots. It has been reseeded in the spring. Should it be mowed or should I leave it alone? Uh, well, this, first off, Right now is a great time to, to do any seeding that you want to do with cool season grasses such as Kentucky bluegrass or tall fescue or perennial ryegrass. So we're right, we're right at the, at the, uh, the apex of, of times to, to seed. So this, this question uh, is, is appropriate for now. If you do seed your turf in uh, this, this fall, uh, mow it when it's perhaps uh, an inch taller than you want your ultimate height to be. One of the problems that, that homeowners have is they're afraid they're going to hurt their new little grass blades by, by mowing it too soon. And if you don't start mowing it fairly soon, what happens is the grass gets long, the, the quicker germinating types will, will shade out the slower types, and when you do mow it, you end up having lots of holes hmm. and bare spots in the turf. So we would certainly recommend that you, that you mow uh, fairly soon after you're, you know, you know if you're going to maintain your turf at two and a half inches, when it hits three, three and a half inches, that's time for the first mowing uh, mm. at that. The other thing you can do with that, with that newly seeded turf is uh, give it a shot of nitrogen when you are mowing it for the first time just because you, uh, you want to speed up the fill. Uh, mm -hmm. or, or, the, or the, the, uh, the density of the turf. And as I mentioned before, this, is a, uh, this time of year is a great time uh, for fertilizing uh, your lawns. It's a great time for, for mowing, uh, for seeding. Uh, we're we're going to come into the time when you, if you want to core aerify to, to, to loosen up your soil, uh, to improve rooting, uh, we're in that time. So the late summer, early fall is just a really great time to do a variety <coughs> of, uh, of lawn activities. So uh, uh, take advantage of, uh, of the long weekend and get out in your lawn and do some work. There we go. <laughs> and that's why we ha like to have right. Dr. Voigt on at this time <laughs> of the year. So, so, I don't have to be pushy, but He's a little pushy. plant some, do some work in the lawn. We plant like some grass. To, we like to think of it as educating, not yes. being pushy, yeah. just educating. Yeah. <laughs> Today in class I said, am I being pushy? And my TA said, no, you're just being an educator. So that's what you were doing. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sticking with that story yeah. <laughs> for you and for me. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's go to a special uh, Mid-American Gardener quiz right now. Of the following trees, which one is immune from Japanese beetle foliar disease? A. Bald Cypress B. Pin Oak C. Basswood D. Tulip Poplar or Yellow Poplar D. Tulip Poplar or Yellow Poplar Japanese beetles plague the landscape of the eastern United States. Without many natural predators, these insects devour plants and trees at will. Learned another thing. I'll tell you, <laughs> just take notes, you learn so much. I could have sworn it was the bald cypress. <laughs> Well, it's funny, they, it doesn't show as much on bald cypress, but um, it's interesting. Our panelists send these quizzes and, and little uh, fa fun facts in, so I don't make them all up, but you do learn things, so that is really fun. Well, going back to the phone lines, let's go and find out what Susie's plant question is on line one. Hi, Susie. Hi, Diane. I have a question about a vine I have planted in the previous years cardinal vine oh, yes. and hyacinth beans, but I'm rethinking the whole thing because it comes up everywhere, and I'm kind of tired of pulling up buckets of it, so I don't mind planting every year, so I kind of want something on my nine-foot wrought iron tree that I can plant and won't come up every year, everywhere. Got any ideas? Well, is the hyacinth bean doing that? Yes, it's even coming up in my yard. 
Really? Now, Cardinal Vine, Cardinal is, Vine is notorious for it. Yeah, it's yeah. just a cousin of Morning Glories, which are weeds. But I planted bunches of <coughs> hyacinth bean, and I had one self-sow, so it's not real common. But I was going to suggest maybe some of the beautiful uh, climbing beans, you know, mm -hmm. and just have the beans are attractive, and you can harvest them. Yeah, like a scarlet runner. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Even the French uh, fillet bean, that is really pretty. It's got really pretty flowers. It's more subtle. Well, some of the long beans also. Yes, the um, yard long one is so yeah, interesting. they have beautiful flowers on them. So the, some of these are vegetables. Yeah, there, so. there's a, one of those that's called red noodle mm -hmm. that gets like three foot red and noodle -y I'm going to sneak in because it goes so fast. Thank you folks for watching. Have a great week. See you next time. Bye-bye.